Hello and welcome to the third video interview of the ECMI series of conversations with external experts. My name is Ljubica Djadjic and I'm senior researcher and head of justice and Go governance cluster at ECMI. And I'm more than happy to welcome Patrick Simon, a senior researcher and research director at the French National Institute for Demographic Studies and Chair of Department Integration and Discrimination of the Institute for Migration and Distinguished Expert on Ethnoracial Statistics. Ethnic data collection is actually the main topic which I want to talk to Patrick because Patrick has published a series of publications on ethnoracial statistics and challenges to collection of ethnic data. This video interview is one, in the, one step in our research, ECMI research in ethnic data and minority protection. And we have been published um, uh, recently a um, special issue of our Jamie uh, journal uh, on ethnic data and minority protection. And we also participated in Jean Monnet project with our uh, partners in uh, Siena, Italy, where we also tried to tackle the problems and challenges to ethnic uh, data uh, processing. Um, that's why I, I'm more than happy and delighted to discuss with Patrick some of the main issues and challenging in collection of ethnic data. Patrick, even today when the uh, corona pandemic is turning our lives upside down, the issue of ethnic data is re-emerging and many international bodies are again calling states to collect data and monitor how both pandemic but also the measures which states impose to fight pandemic uh, impose and what effects they have on various uh, vulnerable and minority groups. And this brings us again to the question of collection of ethnic data and monitoring the situation of uh, minorities, uh, both old or new or vulnerable groups or uh, different minority groups. So my first question to you would be, why ethnic data are so important? Well, uh, it is a very good point to, to raise the, um, the issue of the uh, consequences of the pandemic on uh, minorities. And I think that it has been a hot debate in France, but also in other European countries about uh, uh, if and how much uh, are the uh, minorities, the ethnic minorities are uh, exposed to the virus uh, and what are uh, the, the odds of uh, uh, the, the, the death toll of these minorities. And it happened that uh, um, papers published in the US and in uh, UK uh, demonstrated the, the huge impact of the pandemic, specifically on ethnic and racial minorities in these two countries. And uh, we were not in the position to produce the same kind of analysis in the, in the continental Europe situation for most of the um, one of the issues with that, um, uh, similar ethnic data are not collected in the health system. And for the French case, for example, we, we, the, the best we could do was to find data about place of birth. And it showed very clearly that there are uh, a number of mortality rate for those who are born uh, outside of Europe and specifically in, in sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. So this uh, uh, strong uh, overexposure to the uh, to the COVID nineteen in these two groups, uh, and also a bit on uh, for the Asians, uh, is not you cannot be assessed to uh, what happened to the second generation, or more broadly to those who would self identify as uh, uh, minority members of uh, Arabs or Asians or Black. Uh, uh, category, uh, which is not collected, of course, in, in the uh, official statistics and not in the air system. So there is uh, like a gap between what we can identify with some ex uh, um, well, proxies or not only totally appropriated uh, statistics and what we would like to know. Uh, and, and it's a major um, health policy issue because if uh, minorities are more exposed. That means that there should be some kind of a, um, uh, 
awareness raising uh, campaign and um, communication specifically targeting these minorities to try to protect them more than they are uh, from the from the virus. And so, uh, how can we launch uh, proper and uh, uh, appropriate campaign uh, information campaign? Uh, we don't have the information uh, about who, which group are more vulnerable than the others. And the explanation for this vulnerability would be by comorbidity um, indicators or would be by uh, lack of access to the health system, uh, would be uh, because of uh, discrimination in this health system. So also we have to get more information, more knowledge and statistics in this case are uh, very important. Yeah, and um, thank you. Uh, but you, you mentioned one uh, important thing is that without this data, we cannot get information we need. But exactly this is the question, why we need to know whether minorities, what is the, what is the importance of ethnic data? What information we get and what is the relevance in, of, of collection of ethnic data? What we get actually, actually as information from collecting ethnic data in this specific pandemic, but also in more general? Yeah, so the, of course, in the case of the pandemic, you, you understand very clearly that there is a, an issue of life and death. So it's maybe... Uh, the most uh, eloquent uh, argument in favor of collecting information to try to protect people. But more broadly, um, and, and maybe less uh, uh, dramatic, uh, there are uh, use of ethnic data for public policies in different areas, and specifically uh, to fight against discrimination. So this is one of the uh, main topics in which um, collecting data makes it uh, anti-discrimination policy possible. There are different ways to develop anti-discrimination policy, but one, the most efficient one, is to try to monitor processes in which um, ethnic and racial biases might be used, uh, would be in housing, employment, education, access to health, um, relation with the institutions, uh, there are a lot of, well, of course, the police and justice system. So there are a lot of uh, uh, areas in which monitoring system use statistics uh, uh, very widely to try to identify gaps, disparities between groups, and try to address these disparities when they happen. Uh, without statistics, well, it's possible to do some kind of uh, awareness rising, um, training, explaining the value of diversity, trying to work on stereotypes, prejudices, but it's not helping to try to identify where and how biases occur. And yeah. in our, um, well, now formally equal system, the fact that equality is the value which is shared by most of the democratic societies, uh, it doesn't prevent uh, discrimination, ethnic and racial discrimination to cure. So uh, what we have to do is not track what people have, uh, have in their mind on how system might be uh, unfair because they, they, they have a racist agenda, but how um, apparently equal uh, system do produce uh, biases, uh, disparities, unfair treatment based on race and ethnicity. And to do that, we have to have this monitoring system in which statistics play a major role. So the problem with this monitoring system is the categories by which the disadvantage occurs. Is it nationality? Is it skin color? Is it religion altogether? And if, we, if the statistics are only based on nationality, you missed all the point about the skin color, the religion, or other kind of uh, disadvantage that might, that might occur. So, if you don't have the proper representation of the disadvantage, you cannot protect people from this disadvantage. Mm. Um, of course, one of the problem, uh, if there are benefits from collecting ethnic data, there are also drawbacks, of course, uh, limitations. And one major one is if we try to self-identify or to, 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 to classify the population by ethnic and racial categories, we are reusing the, category, the categories of the disadvantage. And it might be another 
opposite strategy to try to silence, to try to uh, delay these categories from all official statistics, from all representation in the society. So that is what I will call the colorblind strategy. Mm. If we don't talk about minorities, we, if we don't reuse the racial or ethnic categories, we are reducing the extent to which prejudice stereotypes are circulating in the society. So we can see clearly that there are two contradic two strategies which are in contradiction. You cannot use one and the other at the same time. You should make a choice. For now, most of the EU countries from the West have, have decided to favor a uh, colorblind right. exactly. uh, strategy, which is not exactly the case for the Eastern and Central European countries, at least for the uh, national minority dimension, which is not exactly the same that the, the, the struggle against discrimination, which is the recognition of national minorities. Uh, and in this case, there are categories that are circulating officially into censuses, into uh, policies as well. But that's, that's another agenda, which is not totally disconnected from the uh, protection of minorities, of course, but it is not exactly e equivalent to the anti-discrimination policy. Yeah, thank you very much. And also for us in our research here, it is also astonishing that countries develop policies, minority protection policies and laws without actually having data and without continuous monitoring of what is going on with their primary target groups. And that's why we also want to, to address this issue, because I think it's very important also for, for monitoring the situation and position of national minorities, which is in, in our focus. But now I would also want, I would wonder and would ask you if the, the benefits of collection of ethnic data are so clear, at least in, in those who support the, the collection of ethnic data, why are, are states so opposing the idea? Because it's not uniform throughout Europe that all countries collect ethnic data. It's more like half glass full. So, and also some minorities are rather reluctant and don't know whether to engage in this endeavor. So so why is it this skepticism and reluctance to, towards collecting ethnic data? Where it comes from? Uh, I think that uh, the point we were discussing earlier is that uh, if we introduce categories referring to ethnicity and race, we are making these categories more silent in the society. And some minority members might disagree about disclosing their uh, identity or at least the identification to a specific uh, minority category, they might uh, consider that they, it's too risky, or even they don't they don't even uh, recognize themselves into these uh, categories. And so there is always a trade-off between uh, ignoring the categories or reusing them. Uh, and so we have to, to think about two situation which are not exactly equivalent. The first one is when these categories have existed in the past in the census or officially for more or less discriminatory purposes. And, and then the situation changed, but the categories have, have stayed into the census, uh, the official statistics for the purpose of uh, uh, fighting against discrimination protecting rights. So that's exactly the situation of South Africa, for example, or uh, the US, when these categories, racial categories were existing, when uh, racial segregation was official, and they were used mainly against minorities, uh, for the case of South Africa and, and, and the US, and then when the regime had changed, the same categories have been used to protect, to try to redress past uh, uh, discrimination. So uh, this is one case. But the other one is uh, in countries where such categories have never been officially collected beforehand. That was the case of the UK, for example, or for France, or for Germany. Uh, I, when I say not before, I mean not before Second World War. Uh, 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 not after Second World War, I mean. So uh, in this case, there is a, a decision to take to, to introduce categories that have been used sometimes in the, the long past or sometimes in the colonial empire, but not in the, uh, the mainland 
of these uh, colonial powers. And so the problem is um, the, there is a reluctancy to try to give credit to categories that have uh, been heavily charged in history, mm. used for racist purposes. And so the trade-off is more complicated in this case. Uh, in UK, the decision has been taken to reintroduce or to introduce ethnic categories into the census in 1991 after a debate and um, for the specific purposes of fighting against discrimination. That was a claim first from the Commission for Racial Equality that had been uh, uh, created in 1976 to say, well, we cannot, uh, we cannot efficiently try to uh, produce um, uh, schemes against discrimination if we do not have statistics. And so uh, they insisted on the, on the use, on the usefulness of collecting this data. And uh, eventually in 1999, they, 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 get, um, uh, they get the possibility, the opportunity to introduce these categories into the census. And since then, um, that's not the case in France, uh, that's not the case in Germany, or in the Netherlands, or in Belgium, well, it's everywhere. And often uh, the data protection argument is used, saying that it would be against the data protection, especially GDPR, to uh, collect data. But the situation, legal situation, is not so straightforward because there are exceptions under which data, uh, ethnic data collection is actually uh, Possible. So, what do yeah. you think about data protection argument? Just briefly, please. Yeah, absolutely. So, the, the data protection argument relies on uh, on the protection, specific protection, which is given to uh, the, the so called uh, specific data in which ethnic and racial background is protected specifically, like religion or sexual orientation or political opinions and so forth. But uh, what the, 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 the article say that it is forbidden to collect unless, mm -hmm. and the is very important meaning, it's possible to do it with, with a specific type of protection. And, and uh, so you cannot collect data on race and ethnicity easily, but you can do it. So there is a, a, a large consensus on this interpretation for, for the legal scholars mm -hmm. that uh, data protection provision do not prevent collecting data on SEC and race, but they claim that there should be special uh, procedures for that. And yeah, that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, states might use this argument to uh, refuse to collect data, even Mostly, why states are not uh, are reluctant to collect ethnic and racial data is not because of legal protection, is because of their political creed, which is the the objective, and the interpretation of uh, equality right is to become mine, and so that's the major explanation. That is. Uh, for now on, there is a sort of consensus in uh, Western Europe, which is to collect data on the place of birth of the parents, so that is on immigrants and the second generation, or that will be a good way to describe uh, those who are exposed to ethnic and racial uh, discrimination. And that's not totally wrong. It's a, it's a sort of an intermediate strategy, which will not be efficient in 10, ten years' time somehow, because of yeah. course, the, last, the new generation is coming at age, and so uh, this proxy, this kind of uh, equivalent, but not really self-identify uh, categorization uh, will not be um, operational very quickly. Yeah, and this use of proxies actually leads to another question, broader question of methodological challenges, because uh, advisory committee, for example, on the framework connection for the protection of national minorities, uh, has strongly supported the uh, principle and the right to free self-identification and is opposing using proxies as in conflict with the principle of self-identification. But as you mentioned also earlier, this issue of categorizations of groups and then classifications of individuals to these groups is one of the major methodological challenges 
purpose of actually collection of ethnic data. So could you uh, ex explain a little bit about these methodological challenges, both of categorization, but, but broader? What are the main problems, even if uh, authorities are willing to collect ethnic data? So one of the first challenge uh, when it comes to uh, collect ethnic data is the list of categories, of course. Well, there are two ways to do that. You can have an open question like, uh, who do you think you are uh, in terms of your ethnic or racial background? Or, and it means that the people who will answer understand what you're talking about. Mm. It's not always given, considering that in our societies, uh, the notion of race has been somehow uh, uh, well, uh, uh, delayed for a long time. So uh, people do not spontaneously think about themselves in racial terms. So they will not easily answer to this kind of question. And well, my experience, for example, working on the Albanian census show that uh, an open question gives a very large number of answers who, which are not always very uh, accurate, like uh, 600, more than 600 different answers have been given to this question. And then you have to reclassify the answers, mm. which at the end boils down to do exactly the same thing that having a fixed uh, list of categories that you would suggest to people to, to refer to. Uh, the other strategy, of course, is to have this list. So you have to decide which are the categories the most significant, meaningful for those who will answer. So that's a strategy, which is more usable, I think. The problem is that... Uh, a lot of people think they are too more complex, which is true in their identity than the categories that are suggested that they will not identify to these categories. And if there are too many people who do not identify, well, uh, the, the, the collection of data uh, is failing. And so there is always a tension between being very precise and having a long list of, um, of proposals of uh, items to answers, uh, to answer and to have a short one, which is more manageable, but in this case, a lot of people will say, well, I'm, I, don't, I don't fit in. Mm. Okay. okay, so the second challenge is that if you take seriously, there, there are two ways, to, two, two objectives for collecting uh, ethnic and racial data. The first one is to represent the diversity of the society. And the second one, so self-identification is fit pretty well with this uh, uh, objective. The second one is to identify discrimination. In this case, it's not how you define yourself, it's how the others see you, which is important. And in this case, of course, um, um, a third party identification would be more efficient than your own identification, which is troubling, uh, which is also very complicated uh, in the census to do. It's troubling because it is contradicting the objective of self-identification, which is of course, uh, the one uh, mentioned by the uh, framework protection of uh, minorities, as you mentioned, and, and also the international uh, statisticians have also favored self-identification as a major uh, uh, objective and, and criteria for asking questions about ethnicity and race. So we are in between when we ask to self-identify, we consider, which is not totally wrong, that there is a sort of compromise between your own identification and the, the way the others see you. And sometimes there are some gaps between the two, meaning I might identify myself as white, for example, and people see me as black or Arab. Uh, but this kind of uh, distortion, um, misclassification, I'd say, are more or less in studies that have been done around five to six percent, depending on the cases, or maybe some depends uh, who, who you're talking about. But it's true that the more mixity there will be, mixed race person in societies, and which is the case in, uh, in, in a lot of societies, in uh, European societies, at the end, um, the categories will be blurred and it's complicated to self-identify in a single one and to be totally tuned with the objective of anti-discrimination. And what do you then think about multiple identities, which is also now trend, also supported by the advisory committee, not to put people in boxes and to choose opt in and opt out, but just to have the also to has, have a possibility for multiple choices or multiple identity. What do you think about Absolutely. it? Absolutely. So I think multiple identities are very important to collect, and that's give more 
uh, avenues for, for people to self-identify properly. The problem then is to reclassify these multiple identities because, of course, if you think about a policy which is based on uh, 30 or well, no, 64 categories, for example, of uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that won't work. So at the end of the day, what you will do is to say, okay, if you're uh, let's say white is the majority, which is not discriminated, so you're white and something else, well, you will be reclassified in something else. Mm. Because that's the relevant dimension you might be exposed. But it depends how far you go. Uh, take, for example, the uh, Brazilian case in which there are uh, um, affirmative action to access to uh, universities. Uh, selective universities in Brazil, and a lot of people who claim to be black are not perceived as black in, uh, um, in society. And so they want to have the benefit of affirmative action to access to uh, uh, universities and claim to be black for this purpose, but they are refused to be, to be defined as black by, by special committee who have to check who is uh, adequately self-identified as black or not. And you see how far, how very quickly you enter into negotiation about identities. And that makes it very complicated. So if it's not only for the sake of your own identification, which is, okay, everybody is complex, everybody has addictions, no problem. You could be whatever you want. But when it comes to have access to something, to rights, political rights, uh, voting rights, um, access to social rights. Well, in this case, of course, you have to find a balance between what you claim to be on how far you have um, disadvantage related to this claim. And if I claim to be, I don't know, a Roma person in Central European societies, but nobody pursued me as Roma, am I really disadvantaged because I, I consider that uh, myself or not? And that yeah. uh, makes it very complicated. Uh, you have to find like, a, like a, uh, a fit between your own identification and the external identification. And that is very challenging when you collect data. Yeah. So we have to admit that we, we always navigate between, um, well, uh, some kind of compromise between reflecting your complexity and at the same time, reducing your complexity into statistical categories to make it possible to understand the society and the dynamics in the society and to protect your rights. And this tension between um, complexity and reduction is, uh, after all, that, that the aim of statistics. This is the story of statistics. statistics are always doing that. You're not only a man or a woman, you're more complex than that. But at the end of the day, you very often you offered on your binary choice. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is very very good point. Um, another question which uh, which puzzles me also because the region where I come from, I come from the Balkans, where uh, population census is really contested. And for example, in Macedonia, there haven't been a census since two thousand two. Uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, one entity doesn't recognize uh, official results and, and objects the results. In Montenegro, there is also discussion who numbers, how much, and so. So, and this is also another part. I think in Ukraine, it was also an issue about the the census, and somehow it it, it becomes important. The numbers become important, and it, it shows that statistics is more than just counting, but it has an important political background and can be a really contested issue. And this is a question for you as an expert in statistics and population, this kind of statistics. Why these ethnic numbers and whether one group amounts to 7% or 15% or 13% is so important and can be politically uh, problematic? Well, statistics are political. I mean, are genuinely political, ontologically political. So it's not a surprise that there are fights around statistics uh, for different reasons. Uh, one is, uh, of course, the numbers might entail um, the identification of uh, a subpopulation, which would be 
would claim to have more representation somehow, uh, would be political representation or deserve more rights because they are uh, a large number or deserve more protection if they are mistreated uh, in a society. So um, there might be strategies to avoid um, uh, such a numbers uh, to, um, to, to, to prevent people to claim rights, for example. So that could be one reason for the tension. Another one is when there are societies in which uh, the political system is giving representation of this diversity. Uh, and so uh, numbers are equivalent to access to power. So in this case as well, um, for uh, you, Lebanon is a good example for that. Uh, uh, the, the, the distribution of power based on the different communities, religious communities in Lebanon or ethno-religious communities in Lebanon have been freezed in 1973. And since then they do not make any new, account, uh, new accounting system to try to rebalance their, uh, the distribution of power because of course it would raise a lot of issues and after a civil war nobody wants to do to want to get into that and i think somehow in the balkan there are also uh memories of trauma about that and nobody really wants to go in details about what is the share of subpopulation compared to others not only because the political use of this information could be dreadful but at the same time because uh it might be very complicated when you have a lot of mixed couples or mixed families to try to reconstruct an exclusive category to which people would belong. And that's also make it uh, complicated. But at the end of the day, um, we should think about censuses and population numbers as um, a site for struggle. That's a place where uh, representation occur, and this representation is could be contested, and there are uh, struggles on how to measure and to uh, to to count for the subgroups. And very, there are a lot of claims that there is an undercount, for example, of the Roma population in most of uh, Eastern and Central European societies. Uh, that's the case in Serbia or. Yeah, uh, uh, Czech Republic and others, and Hungary. Hungary. And so uh, this is, uh, um, you can understand that this claim uh, comes also from, uh, from uh, the um, minority organization who say that they, they are not properly accounted for by the census because for different reasons. But you see that there is a, a very important uh, political objective as being fairly or being uh, uh, identified properly into uh, into the population numbers, population statistics. So that's the, the explanation why there are always tension or uh, negotiation around censuses. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, we're slowly coming to an end. And I would like to ask a final question uh, about um, the effects of collecting of ethnic data. Because uh, my understanding is that uh, collection of ethnic data is not a goal, but a tool. And then my question would be whether countries uh, who collect ethnic data score better on prohibition of this protection from discrimination, minority protection, and so on and so forth. So is collection of ethnic data sufficient? And whether it's an, somehow whether the, the countries score better or it doesn't need to mean so, that they just only collect data but don't do anything with collected data. So they don't extract information for, from that. So what's your opinion and what do you think? Well, that's a very good question. Actually, you're right saying that uh, collecting statistics is a tool and not an aim in itself, meaning uh, you should do something with these statistics. So if you collect statistics without a proper anti-discrimination policy, these statistics will deliver some kind of a representation of the diversity, uh, but that won't change the situation of the minorities uh, and not produce more equality by itself. So 
there are countries in which uh, collecting data have been thought specifically for the purpose of anti-discrimination policies. I was mentioning the US, uh, UK, Canada could be a good client for that. Well, the question is, do they do better than other countries thanks to this information? It's hard to say. Uh, it's hard to say in the sense that how can we really measure the progress that has been done? Thinking about uh, gender inequalities, which is very pervasive everywhere in the world. Um, there have been a lot of countries which have developed uh, equality programs, uh, gender equality programs, and uh, using statistics extensively. Uh, if you ask me, do they have uh, been uh, able to, to erase inequalities, gender inequalities by doing so? Well, the answer obviously is no. Doesn't mean that uh, these statistics are uh, not useful. Uh, does it mean that it's not useful to have this kind of um, equality programs? No, the answer is no. It would have been worse without this. But of course, uh, in 10 years or in 20 years, you're not reaching, you're not able to overcome uh, centuries or uh, even more of uh, patriarchal and inequality, gender inequality. So it takes time. And that would be the same for minorities. Ethnic and racial discrimination will not disappear on the 20 or 30 years of uh, equality programs. It takes a lot of time. So in countries which have a huge, a huge history of discrimination, the adoption of anti-discrimination policies is a good thing. It does not mean that uh, the position of the minorities have been uh, uh, on a very uh, short period of time uh, been um, well uh, well I'm looking for the word <laughs> it doesn't mean that the position have uh, been positively effective uh, affected uh, uh, in, a, in the large numbers I mean what we see is that there have been progress but the progress are slow and it takes a lot of time um, so I think you might consider that in UK, Canada, and US, even though there are still racism, even though disadvantage for ethnic and racial minorities still exist, obviously, nevertheless, uh, the situation has been improved in certain area of the social life. Um, access to, for example, political representation has been better. Uh, access to a uh, high level of responsibilities in the uh, uh, employment uh, labor market or in um, education have been better, uh, better if nothing would have been done before. But it's not, of course, um, uh, the perfect or the, dis the disappearance of the advantage. Compared to countries who do not collect ethnic statistics, like in Western Europe, um, it's hard to tell if they do better without collecting data based on their colorblind strategy. Is the colorblind strategy efficient? The answer is no. Uh, for the French case, for example, we measure discrimination for 20, a bit more years now. And what we see is that it's very comparable over time. It's not going down. So two system, two strategies, somehow the same outcome, which is uh, racism, ethnic and racial discrimination still occur. So maybe there is not a single uh, uh, model that could be followed, but what we know is that introducing ethnic statistics create more awareness, change the perception and the strategies and the, uh, uh, the care of the existence of discrimination. It put discrimination on the table everywhere and it helps to change and to transform societies. So as a tool itself, it is a transformative tool, not only because it gives information to identify discrimination and to fight against, but also because it put on the table and it creates an awareness of the need to overcome um, racial and ethnic disadvantage. And that's something which is very important because there is a denial very often 
in societies who think about themselves as being very uh, uh, equal in their treatment of minorities. They just think that because they do not develop an official uh, institutional explicit racism, they don't have any problem. There are bad behaviors from individuals, but not a system of discrimination. And the existence of statistics make it possible to demonstrate the existence of this system, which goes beyond the individual behaviors, but rely on a misconception of these institutional processes, which need to be corrected to try to avoid the gaps and the biases which are uh, 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 tackling uh, or to uh, exposing uh, the minorities to, to disadvantage. Great. This is great closure. Yeah, exactly. Ethnic statistics cannot solve all the problems, but this important uh, point, uh, piece in the puzzle of minority protection and uh, combating discrimination. Great, Patrick. I really enjoyed this interview. It uh, helped me to understand many of issues and, and challenges of ethnic data. I'm sure it was also interesting for our uh, listeners and our public. So many thanks for your participation and for all this great interview. Uh, I wish you all the best. I wish you to stay healthy. And I hope that we will also collaborate in the future. To all others, I uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, and please uh, uh, follow us on the uh, ECMI website as well on social media. Thank you very much. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs>